Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to continue these series of videos in our group reading of Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit in this 15th lecture. We'll move on to the section of the text titled Individuality, which takes itself to be real in and for itself. Now, I mentioned recently that the rate of video production is able to go up now because the sections have become shorter and shorter you might recall that uh, the observing external nature section was some 53 paragraphs long well today we're going to be looking at a section of the text which is literally just three paragraphs in total and yet it is all the more difficult for that very reason this is a very weird part of the text which you really have to go through a lot of times to have any idea what's going on because um, in contrast with the last few sections which were very literary they featured um, memorable and easily identified characters. You had, of course, Faust in the first section, then you had Rousseau, the um, Enlightenment intellectual who believes on grounds of reason alone in the noble savage, and then you have, um, finally, the knight of virtue waging a holy war against selfishness within the world. Um, in this section, the character really is not so easily identifiable. Instead, you're talking about very abstract philosophical themes, like what does it mean to um, have a sort of phenomenological shift in which the status of the category itself changes. Well, that's a pretty abstract thing to think about. What does it mean to go from potentiality to actuality? Um, and what does it mean to have a type of self-actualization, which goes beyond the ideal of action itself that we saw in the past three phases. So rather than perhaps deal with an easily identifiable character here, you're actually getting down to the underlying philosophical presuppositions of the phenomenology of spirit itself. And that is what makes this mere one and a half page section something which we'll have to spend about as much time um, in this lecture as would be given to a much longer but perhaps more easily digestible part of the book. So I'd like to thank everybody who has supported the channel and joined the school. Um, once again, we are doing something here which really cannot be done anywhere else. And I also wanted to mention that um, the agreement to have two videos per week is something we're still abiding by, but um, I'm actually going to post next week's videos um, at the very end of this week. Okay, so um, the videos for this week have already been done. The two, this third one you're seeing appear today on Friday, that's really for next week, and then hopefully I can get the next section out tomorrow at the very latest on Sunday, and that's because I'll be traveling next week someplace where I will not have access to internet or my laptop, so um, the the schedule is still basically the same two per week, but you'll see them appear a week early. So once again, thank you everybody. So I will begin by reminding you that we have just passed all the way through the first two broader phases of reason. You might recall that observing reason was basically a triad of um, first observing external nature, and then we try to uh, um, turn that back on the self by doing the scientific analysis of the mind through logic and psychology. And then um, we have a very weird third phase, which focuses on understanding um, the personality of the subject, not through the sort of inner workings of its mind, but rather through the outer manifestation of first physiognomy and then phrenology, literally scanning the bumps on a skull to understand the pathological tendencies of the person. You could get a full psychological profile of a person without access even to their brain. You could tell whether they are a natural bro uh, born murderer or some other category of the very worst kinds of criminals simply through um, looking for irregularities in their bone structure. And then, of course, we had the triad of active reason, which were Faust, um, the law of the heart, and the knight of virtue. And we've completed um, that phase also, and we're about to launch into another triad, which will be the final of really these three broader phases of reason itself before entering spirit. But it's less clear what exactly this third phase is. Um, it is titled formally C, individuality which takes itself to be real in and for itself. And while it is somewhat clear that this introduces um, the final set of phases of reason, <laughs> whatever that means, um, it is far from clear at first glance what reason itself actually is if it is no longer observing reason or active reason. You might legitimately ask what could possibly be left if we were already active in the last phase.
More difficult still is the way that this section itself says very little, and I mean that in the literal sense that it's only a page and a half long. And for that reason, it really is one of the most cryptic and dense sections of the entire book. For that reason, it might be useful to begin by contrasting it with the section we just got out of. You might recall in the last video that the Knight of Virtue had spent his entire section basically fighting a delusional battle to try to rid the earth of all self-interest, even his own self-interest. He claimed that this um, removal of self-interest was a necessary condition for the good to be actualized in reality. This was because he understood virtue to be the essence which was just inherently good. It's not even the law of my heart or any invention of a particular person. It's simply intrinsically good. And because it has that sort of impersonal validity originating from no particular um, individual, the um, roadblock to its actualization is precisely individuality. You can only have um, the good universalized through every person within the human population if they agree to suspend all of the things that make them unique as people. Um, with this new phase of reason, however, we do the exact opposite. Now reason simply accepts that there is a certain unity between this good and the same self-interest which the knight had mistakenly labeled as vice itself. So radical a change as this is, of course, only possible if the meaning of the term the good itself had first undergone a similarly massive transformation. By this phase of the phenomenology, we find that the good really can no longer be defined as a virtue of the heart, for we saw in the previous two sections that a virtue of the heart is necessarily something which can only be posited on an abstract level. Both law of heart and the knight of virtue found themselves Themselves stuck between a rock and a hard place because um, the same law which demanded that they act a certain way, it was not enough, of course, merely to contemplate virtue. You had to actually embody it with an action, but as soon as you acted, that virtue ceased to be itself. The law of heart, you might be reminded, was eventually driven by this cognitive dissonance into a state of full-blown insanity in which it invented so many elaborate conspiracy theories about the so-called fanatical priests and gluttonous despots who had ruined his plans to uh, moralize the entire world by already brainwashing every other heart into a state of having no vacant real estate space left for him to come in and colonize their thoughts with his own thoughts. But in laying the blame on the unfavorable social conditions out there in the realm of actuality, it never really dawned on this guy to just ask whether perhaps the problem was simply with the idea of the good which the law of heart had posited in the first place. This was an idea of the good which could, of course, only exist in a purely abstract and purely interior form. In contrast with the law of heart, reason now explicitly redefines the good as this self-actualization itself, rather than as any absolute pre-given ideal which is only ever later clumsily shoved through a filter of actualization which somehow never really works. No, at this stage, reason simply posits the doing as the absolute, rather than grant that status to an abstraction which fails the most basic ontological test of having being at all. Reason has therefore evolved to the predictable third phase of being in itself and for itself, rather than merely in itself as observing reason was in its single-minded fixation on the external object or merely for itself, as active reason was, in its similarly one-sided fixation on the subject. One might ask, though, how this third phase could be any more active than the second phase already was, considering that that phase was literally called active reason. Well, the answer is that this third phase is not active reason, but rather self-actualizing reason. But what does that actually mean? Given that this section is only three paragraphs long, we'll have to read between the lines a lot more to follow Hegel's logic here. In paragraph 394, the section formally opens with reason changing its mind about how essence and end are to be defined. You might recall that the Knight of Virtue had defined essence as the universally valid virtue. 
which can only be embodied in its pure state in the real world if each person first agrees to repress all of the idiosyncrasies of his or her own individuality. Well, in contrast with that, reason now openly celebrates these individual contingencies as so many gifts and capacities which unite the universal with the individual in a spontaneous interfusion of the two, to use his own memorable phrase. This is itself really the proper meaning of both essence and end, or more specifically, the purpose of such rational action. In briefer terms, we could say that the end or the purpose of rational action is no longer some detached or some hopelessly abstract ideal beyond the individual. Instead, we have evolved now into a new kind of community in which each member is its own end, for everything else is nothing to it. This is almost like the realization in uh, observing external nature that the end of um, the animal's activity is not any one particular thing, but simply itself. The purpose of its action simply is its own life. Well, whereas that was realized with regard to the external object under observation back then, now reason basically comes to a similar realization about its own activity, that the end of it simply is itself. In other words, if the end of your action simply is yourself, that is by far the most extreme example of self-interest which you could possibly imagine. But for that very reason, self-interest has lost its former status as the ultimate vice, as the Knight of Virtue claimed last video, as the end of all rational action simply becomes the assertion of one's individuality through one's own self-actualization. This is is a self-actualization which differs from the mere action we saw in the preceding phases of active reason because whereas Faust, Rousseau, and the Knight of Virtue all maintained a strict dualism between their own personal intent and the alien exterior world which resisted any attempt to actualize that personal intent, intent excuse me, in reality, reason is now absolutely certain of its reality and no longer seeks only to realize itself as end in an antithesis to the reality which immediately confronts it, but on the contrary has the category as such for the object of its consciousness to quote Hegel himself. You might recall, though, that all the way back in Lecture 7, the very first phase of reason had already mentioned the Kantian notion of category, but had ultimately dismissed it as an empty construct originating from a bad idealism, which led to the circular reasoning that I can only know the other through knowing myself first. That, of course, was something which was not a satisfactory definition of reason, and we were led into the labyrinth of observing reason as a response to that failure. Well, at this later stage of reason, the Kantian category has suddenly reappeared, but has now succeeded in meeting the conditions for consciousness of self to be consciousness of law-governed objectivity and vice versa. In other words, self-actualizing reason is certain of itself through its own acts, and vice versa. In paragraph 395, Hegel clarifies that uh, reason's relation to the category has evolved at this point beyond what it had been in the earlier observational and active rules. In other words, the category was still there in the background during all of those parts of the phenomenology, but it was largely just filling the role of an abstract filter through which an object was viewed by a detached subject. This was a filter which ironically ended up distorting more than it clarified by establishing so many categorical distinctions which avowedly did not have any existence beyond the subject's own mediating thought process. Now, in contrast, Hegel claims that self-consciousness has returned into itself out of those opposed determinations which category had for it. Instead of doing away with the category altogether, though, it has instead for its object the pure category or the category which has become aware of itself.
With this new category established, reason leaves behind all of the previous shapes which lie forgotten behind it and no longer confronted as a world given to it, to quote Hegel himself. Reason, in other words, is now freed up to evolve to a whole new paradigm of phenomenological awareness. Paragraph 396 tells us that this par uh, paradigm simply is that of self-awareness, for it starts afresh from itself and is not occupied with an other, but only with itself. Being freed from the need to accept consciousness of an external object as the irreducible paradigm of awareness, reason is now finally free to really act, as opposed to the pseudo-acting which it had consumed it in the previous three phases. For now it sees that action alters nothing and opposes nothing. Action is only the pure form of a transition from a state of not being seen to one of being seen, and the content which is brought out into the daylight and displayed is nothing else but what this action already is in itself. In plainer terms, reason now is understood to be a symmetrical accord between action as intended and action as performed. It is still somewhat unclear, however, how reliably this will be accomplished within the text itself. And for that reason, we now launch into the final triad of reason consisting of the following phases. First, reason as a realm of individuals then reason as universal selfhood or moral legislation, and finally reason as testing laws. In the course of this procedure, reason will eventually become spirit, and this will occur through overcoming the persistent obstacle of a merely abstract law. Stay tuned.